If you were going to define a word, the word, word, how would you do it? Define the word, word. What definition, what words would you use to define the word, word? Interesting thought, isn't it? The Greek word from which we get our word, word, is logos, L-O-G-O-S in English letters, logos. And it's used in the Bible dozens and dozens of times. And usually in the Bible has a different meaning from the meaning that we would give our English word, word. We're going to study that word, word, this morning. I want you to open your Bible and read it with me from the book of John, the Gospel according to John, chapter 1. And if you didn't bring your Bible, look in the songbook rack, borrow one from there, and read along with me. I think that you'll benefit from the study more if you can read and study with me as we go through these first few verses of this great book. Now before we start reading in John 1, I want to tell you just a little bit about this gospel, the gospel account according to John. John had a brother, James. Their daddy was Zebedee. Their mother was Salome. It is believed by most Bible scholars that John's mother and the mother of Jesus were sisters. And if that be true, then that means that the author of this book was a first cousin to Jesus. They obviously then would have had a lot of association with each other, and indeed they did. Of those associates of Jesus who are mentioned most frequently as being his closest friends and companions, John was one of them. Peter, James, and John. Those three mentioned so often in the Bible. This gospel, according to John, is quite different from the first three gospel accounts. Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written, as best we can determine the date, many years before the gospel according to John. And they're different in their makeup or content. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are said to be synoptic. That is, they give a broader and general view, more comprehensive view of the entire life of Jesus. Whereas Matthew and Luke began with the birth of Jesus, John does not do so at all. Warren Wearsby, in the preface to his commentary on this great book, said that when you read and study this book, you're not just studying a book, you're studying a man. For this book really focuses <clears throat> upon Jesus the man. And it is believed that John wrote this right toward the end of his own life, toward the end of the first century. You may recall that John is the author of five different books in the New Testament. This one being one of them, and then the three books that are companions, first, second, and third John, and then of course he was the author of the book of Revelation, the, God, the revelation given to John. Revelation, we believe, was written by John 
from the revelation that he received from God in the early part of the 90s, 90 A.D., possibly as late as at 95 A.D. You will recall that John was exiled to that island in the Aegean Sea called Patmos. He was exiled there, banished there during the Domitian persecution. And then he, after leaving there and being allowed to return, spent his latter days in the city of Ephesus. So possibly, and I led you through that to help you to see the perspective of this man, possibly after being exiled in persecution, possibly after preaching nearly all of his life, spending much, much personal time with Jesus, possibly, if we've dated it all correctly, this book was written by a man who was nearly a hundred years old and has such a great insight to Jesus himself. Read with me now the first 14 verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man who comes into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. There are some half dozen noteworthy facts and truths about Jesus Christ that need to be noted in this section of Scripture. And I shall bring your attention to them one by one, starting with the first verse. Look at it. In the beginning was the Word. Now from the context, it is obvious that the word Word here refers to Jesus Christ. And if your Bible is a Bible that capitalizes the pronouns that refer to Jesus and God the Father and God the, the Spirit, you may also note that the word Word is capitalized. And that signifies that even the translators of that version believed that this referred to Jesus. There is no accurate disputation of such. But the thing that I want you to note in the very beginning is the word beginning. In the beginning was the word. Jesus was there in the beginning. Meaning that he was pre-existent. Meaning that he was not created contrary to what our friends who are Jehovah's Witnesses and some other religious groups believe. For there are those who believe that Jesus was created by God the Father, but he was not. Jesus is, like God the Father, from everlasting to everlasting. Now, I'm everlasting, 
and so are you. I'm eternal, and so are you, meaning we do not have an end. As I stated during Brother Baron Blackburn's funeral this past Monday, when we die, we don't cease to exist. But unlike God, we had a beginning. God, unlike us, is not only without end, he is without beginning. So Jesus was there in the beginning, not created. Secondly, notice in verse 1, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is God himself. God is the name of divine nature. And there are three persons who possess that divine nature. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Jesus is God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So recognize the fact that Jesus is not just a man, but also God from the very beginning. Now notice verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. Well, if you look back at the middle part of verse 1, you see the phrase, and the word was with God. Then in verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. And this simply tells us the, that God, the Son, was more than just present with God the Father, but he was active. He was interactive with God the Father. And the manner in which he was interactive with him is detailed for us or referred to uh, in verse 3. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Jesus was the agent of creation by God the Father. Do you recall in Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth? Then do you recall later on in the chapter when Moses records, and God said, let us make man? It was plural. Let us make man. That refers to God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. All three were there. All three everlasting to everlasting. All three present at the creation. All three a part of the creation. And in verse 3 of John's gospel account, I'm reading from the King James Version, and I read all things were made through him. In the King James Version, the word is by him. All things were made by him. All things were made through him. He was the agent through whom the creation of the earth took place. Paul referred to this same fact in Colossians 1.16, saying that all things in the heavens, in the earth, under the earth, all these things were created by him and for him. And in the passage of Scripture that Robert read for us a while ago in Hebrews 1, we're told that he was the one by whom all things were created. Then in verse 4, in him was life. That is, Jesus has the power to create life and to sustain life. Remember, he's the one through whom creation was accomplished. So he created life, and it is by his word that all of this is kept intact. He sustains life. I believe that Brother Guyan Wood stated this very effectively when he says that the life 
to which John here makes reference includes but is not limited to spiritual life. All physical life was created by the Lord, but even spiritual life itself comes from him. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. When Jesus came to this world, he came bringing spiritual light to a world full of spiritual darkness. It wasn't literally dark or physically dark, for God had created the sun and the moon as the greater light and the lesser light to rule the day and the night. So it's not physical or literal darkness to which is referred here, but spiritual darkness. And Jesus came to bring light, and he said of himself, I am the light of the world. So he brought that light to the world of spiritual darkness. And I ask a rhetorical question. Did everybody believe in him and follow him? No. Did the majority believe in him and follow him? No. Not even today do the majority follow him. And he himself said, as recorded in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, that in the judgment, the majority will have been found in that way of destruction. So we then understand what John meant when he said the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. And that word comprehend there means to receive and embrace. They didn't receive him. They didn't embrace him. And you will notice, look on down. Let's read on down to it, beginning at verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This is in reference to John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that is, of Jesus, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man who comes into the world, referring to Jesus. But now notice verses 10 and 11. He, Jesus, was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, that is his own place, the place where he created, which he created. And his own did not receive him. Those people who were his own people most assuredly referring to the Jewish people who had the promise from God but they didn't receive him. They were the ones who joined in the cry, kill him. He came to the world, the world he created. And he was in the world, but the world didn't accept him. The majority of this world rejected him. So he came to his own, his own received him not. Now some did accept him and receive him. So read verse 12 and 13. Look at this carefully. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And that being born in verse 13 refers to their spiritual birth, the spiritual birth of those who received him. But I want you to notice something now in verse 12 that is quite significant in light of what is taught in the religious world in general and the scheme of redemption as revealed in the scriptures. In verse 12, the statement is made by John that those who did receive him were given the power or the right to become children of God. 
those who believed in him were given the right to become children of God. I repeat, I repeat, now listen carefully. Those who believed in Jesus were given the right to become children, to become children of God. Now let me state another fact. Therefore we know that those who did, did believe in him were not automatically children of God. They were given the right to become children of God. But the act of faith in Jesus, the act of believing in Jesus, did not make them children of God. Now that's what the Bible teaches. Now you're aware of the fact, I would think, that in the religious world in general, the prevailing um, belief is that when one believes in Jesus, he's safe from sin. That if you receive Jesus into your heart, believe in Jesus as the Son of God, then you're saved and you're a child of God. But this scripture says that those who received the Lord, those who believed in Jesus, were given the power to become children of God. Now do not misunderstand me. I'm not minimizing the importance of faith in Jesus. One cannot be saved without believing in Jesus as the Son of God. But the Bible clearly teaches that the one who is to be saved, the one who will be saved by Jesus the Savior, is the one who believes in him and obeys him. Here's how he said it. Now these are not my words. These are the words of Jesus the Savior. Here's how he said it. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. So the Son of God himself, the Savior of the world, himself has said, the one who will be saved is the one who believes in him and is baptized. And in Hebrews 5, 8, and 9, the Hebrew writer said, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. So those people who believe in Christ are doing the right thing. But they have no promise of salvation and do not have the forgiveness of sins according to the Bible until they act upon that faith and obey the commands of Jesus Christ and are baptized for the remission of their sins. And if I'm going to teach the Bible faithfully and accurately, I can teach it no other way. But now I want you to notice what I think is the crowning part of this text. Verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That Word that was in the beginning, that Word that was with God, that Word that was God, that word through whom all things were made, that word which was the light, that word which has life and creates and sustains life, that word is God, that word, that God came to earth to be a man and to live as a man among men. But he came also to die for man. Turn your Bible to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. One of the most profound scriptures in all of the New Testament, in my judgment, is that which we're about to read. Philippians 2, verse 5 through verse 8. Let this mind be in you, 
which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. The one who created this earth came to this earth, God in the flesh. We call it the incarnation. God in the flesh. Was he God on earth? Yes. Was he flesh? Yes. A man? Yes. Just like you and me? Yes. Subject to temptations like us? Yes. In all points, subject to temptations like us. Yet without sin, Hebrews 4 says. How determined was he to do the will of God? To the point of dying on the cross. How much did he love you and me? To the point of dying on the cross and being cut off from God. As he entered that Hadean realm, he cried out, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? We sang about it a while ago. Why did my Savior come to earth? And to the humble go. Why? Because he loved me so. How appropriate then for us to sing, Oh, what a Savior. What love. What mercy. What compassion. And he's my Savior. God came down to be like me so that I, in spite of my sins, can be like him. What a savior. Open your songbooks, please, to the number announced. Speech on. Music recognition. Selected. Music timer. Button. Selected. Screen recording.